Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure, of course, to be here today. Um, <clears throat> so let me formulate the problem straight away, and then I'll give some motivation for it and then uh, formulate the results. And I think that will be uh, the end of the time. Uh, so I'll denote by sim that the space of n by n matrices that are symmetric, uh, real symmetric, if the field is real or Hermitian. the complex case uh, and most of the results apply to both cases. Uh, when there is a difference, I will uh, specify which case the results apply to. Um, so for each matrix, there, each matrix has eigenvalues that we will order in increasing order. Uh, they're real, of course. <clears throat> and uh, M will be a D dimensional complex matrix. So smooth, compact manifold. And suppose we have F which is a function from the manifold to the matrices. So basically, I'm viewing the manifold as my parameter space, and F is parametric family of operators, or in this case, matrices, living on this manifold. Uh, often I'm interested in manifolds that are really simple, like a torus. Uh, sometimes, Manifolds are actually really, really complicated. And then maybe I want to explore the manifold but by looking at the spectra of the matrices. Um, so what we want, very roughly, is Morse theory uh, or the eigenvalue so we choose a case eigenvalue. We focus on this eigenvalue on its own, how it uh, what it is like as a function from manifold to the reals. So, so a matrix family on the manifold, we just focus on, on one eigenvalue in the ordered ordering uh, that we prescribed. So let me uh, quickly review what is Morse theory. So this is advertisement for Morse theory. For now, let's let's focus on functions that are smooth. Um, the Morse theory, basically, in a nutshell, it links together the number and type of critical points with the topology of, of a function defined on the manifold. So here we have a function, a real valid function on the manifold. So uh, Morse theory links number and type of critical points with the topology of the, the manifold. So some topological invariance. of the underlying manifold uh, to give the simplest example. And this was origin of Morse theory before Morse. Uh, people were saying, right, a height function on a sphere on the Earth, there must be a maximum, there must be a minimum. Things like this. And if there are more than two maximum, maybe there is a saddle point in between. <clears throat> um, so let's consider phi, which is twice differentiable function. And of course, critical points of 
why are the points on the manifold where the gradient vanishes? Uh, the Morse index is uh, the number of eigenvalues in the spectrum of the Hessian that is that are negative. So spectrum of the Hessian of phi at point X such that they're negative. Uh, where the Hessian of, uh, of a function at point X is just the matrix of the second derivative with respect to some choice of local coordinates on the manifold. Okay, from one to T. And the Morse index is independent on the, on the coordinate choice. <laughs> So um, what I'll need for the future is uh, what I call Morse polynomial. Everybody calls Morse polynomial. Uh, uh, you're going to assume uh, it's generic in a Morse function at this point already? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so the standing assumption, uh, underlying assumption here is that all critical points uh, are non-degenerate. So this Hessian, uh, the determinant is not zero. So assume non-degenerate Hessian for all X in critical points. Thank you. The so Morse polynomial, uh, Morse polynomial corresponds to a certain function phi. We define it as the sum over all critical points of phi. And uh, for each critical point, we uh, so there is a dummy variable t. Doesn't play control. Uh, so it's. Uh, we add a monomial t to power mu of x or for each point. I will also use the notation pm of t with a Poincare polynomial. of the manifold M. So this is similarly defined generating function of, um, of the homology groups of the manifold M. I am not going to, to explain more of it. Just, uh, just believe me that for a nice manifold M, you can look it up. It's some polynomial that describes the topological type of And uh, the theorem, which is, called Morse inequalities. It says that uh, for any nice function phi on the manifold, uh, nice satisfying this assumption, uh, polynomial, the Morse polynomial, the, the phi polynomial, it depends on the choice of the function. This guy is fixed by the underlying manifold. If we subtract the two, um, the answer is divisible by one plus T, and it gives me some polynomial that is a remainder. Uh, why is it called more inequalities? Because all coefficients of R are, are non-negative. RT, that's non-negative. Efficient, uh, which gives me a bunch of inequalities. 
let me do the, uh, the, the classical, go through the classical example of a Morse function on the torus. So uh, I have a torus, I put it, just two torus, I put it vertically like this, and my function phi is just the height. I, I pay, placed it vertically, and uh, the value of the function at a point is just the height from the table. So what are the critical points here? Well, the, the maximum is right here. The minimum is right here. And there are two more critical points right here and right here, which are several points because here I can go down in one direction and up in the other. And here I can go up in this direction, but down in that direction. So, so this is a max. If we go through the calculation, mu will be equal to two. So according to this rule, to that point, we associate t squared. Saddle point, the Morse index is one. According to that rule, we associate t to the power one, t to the power one here, and t to the power zero at the bottom. Uh, so to summarize p5 for this particular function is one plus t squared m. Again, you can look it up in uh, chapter one on any book of uh, algebraic topology is one plus t squared. And uh, the remainder polynomial is zero, which is fine. It's a polynomial with non-negative coefficients. Let me now deform my torus a little bit. Topologically, it remains the same, but uh, we can view it as a different function defined on the same topological space. I'll, I'll, I'll bend it a little bit like this. And by bending it like this, I am, I'm introducing another maximum. So I have two maxima. And this gives me, according to the prescription, 2t squared. I still have this saddle point, this saddle point, and this minimum. But now I, I introduce by, by molding the torus, I introduced another saddle point. So we have three saddle points now, and still one minimum. If I is uh, 2t squared plus 3t plus 1, the difference with the Poincare polynomial is t squared plus t, which magically is divisible by 1 plus t. And the remainder is uh, the remainder polynomial is t with positive coefficients as predicted. This factor here, basically, it's telling me that I cannot create a critical point on its own. I can only create it in pairs of indices that are adjacent. <clears throat> All right, so this is a, it's a really cool result. What's, What's my motivation uh, for it? Why do I want similar results for, for eigenvalues? So let me go to my motivation. Uh, motivation for what? For Morse, wanting to have Morse theory for the eigenvalues of uh, operator families. So the original motivation, my personal original motivation was from nodal statistics of uh, usually graph eigenfunctions, although other eigenfunctions, I also want to study. But particularly graph, because on graphs we have uh, this, uh, this theorem that links together the statistics of the number of zeros of eigenfunctions with 
with statistics of Morse indices. of some set of critical points of lambda k. Uh, so this is not just eigenfunction, it's it's eigenfunction, case eigenfunction, okay. So, uh, so to understand zeros of eigenfunction of uh, eigenfunction fk, we can, um, so we have a fixed operator then we sort of expanded, we embedded as a point, just a point in a family defined on the torus, and then look at the critical points of the eigenvalue. And uh, this is an ongoing project with Leora Lon, who I think talked about this uh, probably more than once. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, a similar related motivation is uh, spectral minimal partitions. I'm not going to talk much about this thing. Um, it's a uh, so branch of uh, spectral theory uh, uh, that got started more or less by Helfer, Terracini, Hoffman, Ostenhoff. Um, I just want to mention that here the manifold is really simple. We understand the manifold. Well, it's, it's just the torus. Here the, re the situation is reversed. We want to understand the, the manifold of this spectral partitions. Uh, it's actually infinite dimensional. So I'm not sure how we can do it, but maybe on graphs it's finite dimensional. We can do it. Um, uh, but I think this this theory that I'm presenting today should help us to understand this. Um, another motivation is kind of discovered post factum. I talked to uh, John Keating. He said, "Hey, it should, should apply to this thing." Uh, conical intersections in quantum chemistry. Again, I don't want to go into it in the interest of time, but um, basically there the manifold is all physical configurations of the molecule. So if the molecule has many atoms, you have lots of parameters. Uh, the, the dimension of the manifold is large, and uh, and then the they're studying just the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian de defined with this atomic configuration. Uh, what I want to maybe spend a few minutes on is this nice, uh, fairly simple application of of this theory that, uh, again, I discovered after we kind of worked on this, but it's uh, 60, 70 years old. So this is uh, Van Hove singularities. So, so general, yeah, let, me, let me put the... General title. So, so this is class of applications to dispersion relations of periodic structures. Uh, and Van Hove singularities is one of the dispersion relation. Uh, Said again. What's the dispersion relation? Uh, this I will define in a second. Um, but throughout the talk, actually, the dispersion relation uh, is just my, my jargon for this function. So the eigenvalue 
of a family of operators as a function defined on the manifold, this what I generally call the dispersion relation for the purposes of this talk, which is uh, not a common terminology, I guess, but I wanted to highlight the, the fact that uh, there, is, there is a connection to physics. So uh, Van Hoff in 1957 studied the elastic frequency distribution. Um, so there is a crystal and uh, you look at distribution of frequencies at which the crystal can vibrate. Uh, the same, exactly the same thing applies to the quantum, but, but he was studying sort of mechanical vibrations. And uh, well, before him, people were looking at the frequency distribution, uh, newest frequency, so it's square root of the eigenvalue. And they were measuring how many In how many ways the crystal can vibrate at a certain frequency and plotting uh, pictures like this. I just put it vertically for a reason that will become. Uh, uh, is this a, a one dimensional thing or two dimensional thing or n dimensional? Two, two and three dimensional things. And continue, I mean, like just a periodic differential operator? Just periodic, uh, just. Uh, for, for, for the purpose that we can we can just imagine a periodic uh, sequence uh, periodic structure of masses connected by strings kind of vibrate. Okay. Um, and you can do it in one dimension. You don't see the the Van Hoop structures in one dimension. So, so I mean, you're really talking about quasi momenta here, right? So so this is uh, frequencies. Uh, I will plot in quasi momentum in a second. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, so this is just, just structure build of balls and springs, basically periodic. We can bounce it, it vibrates with certain frequency with, with uh, kind of waves similarly propagating this way, but maybe that way, and that's the number of waves. And, but you're talking about a, a periodic uh, uh, system, right? Uh, the system is periodic, yes. <laughs> it is periodic, it's periodic. The underlying system in one cell is just a, a bunch of springs as so one dimension. No, I heard uh, so oh, what, oh, the, what is the the the, the, period, the, the periodicity is two or three, one or two or three dimensional. No, I'm asking what the operator. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, what is he studying? It's a physics. What is he studying? I, I, it's a physics paper. It's a little bit hard to pinpoint uh, the operator. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we can. We can interpret it as a discrete Laplacian. We can interpret it as, as just masses and springs to second order uh, OD system of ODs, I think. Uh, okay. Let me just describe the, the, uh, the idea of, of the thing and, um, and not dwell on the precise nature of the operator. So, um, we have this sort of distribution. Uh, so we had it before you. Uh, Montreal in 47 uh, actually computed it for, for an example. So I think for, for precise description of one possible operator I should have looked uh, in this paper. Uh, he, he, did, he, he calculated and he found that it's actually a peak. If you do it continuously rather than experimentally at certain frequencies, you, you, you find an infinite peak. Uh, and uh, small it. So you're describing a density of states here. Yeah. This is a density of states, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would be in the block wave theory. Yeah. Yeah. Then we know what you're talking about. All right, cool. <laughs> Sorry, hard to uh, uh, get the right terminology. Um, Smollett, uh, Smollett pointed out that these things are, are, are due to, to saddle points in the dispersion relation. So, so what? You mean the peaks. The peaks, yes. So we have, uh, let's say our crystal is two dimensional. So we have two quasi momenta. We have uh, frequency here and, and then we have, some underlying operator which we can Plekev block transform 
and then uh, look at the eigenvalues as functions of, uh, of this quasi-momentum. So it's some sort of surface living uh, over two-dimensional torus or three-dimensional torus, depending on the number of uh, periodicities in our uh, structure. And uh, Smollett pointed out that the saddle points, they, so, so the link between this surface and this distribution is just, the distribution is the value distribution of this function. And if we have a saddle point where the gradient vanishes, the values sort of accumulate around this point. So uh, a bunch of those peaks can be right? Is, so there might be a bunch of those peaks, yes, but they may coincide if, if the saddle points lie at exactly the same level. All right. uh, there, is a, uh, there is the gradient vanishes around like a maximum as well, for example, but, um, but you, you need to integrate over the Fermi surface, over the level curve. Now the level curve here, it's, it's kind of large and the level curve here, it's, it's, it's very small. So, so the, the maxima actually don't result in peaks, but the saddle points, points do result. And I think it was understood and Smollett explained by Van Hove, but what Van Hove said that uh, is that we must have uh, saddle points. Whatever the crystal is, whatever parameters you choose inside your operator that gave you this uh, dispersion surface, there must be saddle points. Why? Because this surface is defined on a torus, and for the torus, we have Morse theory. Uh, it probably helped Van Hove that uh, he was visiting the institute at the time, and uh, Morse uh, was uh, just down the hall from um, actually, Van Hove analyzed it fairly carefully, and he recognized that I recognize the problem that we struggle with mathematically that we want to overcome is that eigenvalue is not a smooth function as, as a function of parameter in general, because uh, there may be degeneracies of the eigenvalues. And so there is another eigenvalue coming in. And around this degeneracies, uh, eigenvalue multiplicities, uh, the surface is no longer differentiable. So you have to actually understand this points of multiplicity. And, and he, he, he gave good argument, uh, good heuristic, I'd say, argument why these points don't actually destroy more theory. And you can view our results as the proof of uh, his argument that, that the more theory survives. And yes, you still must have several points, so it, it works. And uh, we also extend it to an arbitrary high dimension. Uh, it's hard to, to come up with crystals that have uh, more than three dimension periodicity, but I hear people manage to do that. Uh, uh, so people study uh, whole, <clears throat> whole effect in four and six and higher dimensional crystals by introducing some parameters, some driving and things like this. All right, so... Um, I mean time, time parameter then. A time parameter, but they kind of managed to have several time, time parameters, maybe several... I, I, I don't know. Uh, that's what Jacob told me uh, yeah, the last night. So I didn't have time to check, check up. Uh, these surfaces they can intersect too, right? Yeah, yeah. So they can touch, they can intersect. So, 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 and they can, they can, they can be flat, flat man. That's the most interesting part. Yeah. Uh, so, so the flat is difficult for us, but we we say all right. That's that's why I wrote the generic case. So I'm excluding the flat. So. Uh, so what's the most uh, the, the main difficulty 
for us and the difficulty that Van Hove was also struggling with is precisely that these surfaces intersect, they have singularities. The, the lambda k is not in general. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the relics great theorem. Yes. yes. If you have one variable. If, if, uh, if you have one variable, you can resolve these things nicely. Uh, but even then, we may want to, to no, 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 interpret yeah. this point as do not resolve it this way, but actually say, well, it's a, it's a maximum. Uh, but um, in general, if the eigenvalue is simple, then it is analytic. Um, and I mean, the nice thing about Relic is if you have a parameter space, it chooses for you the basis, which uh, you, and you, you don't know what, it knows how to find this basis, which is smooth in one parameter. It's quite a remarkable theorem. I think it should be taught in linear algebra. <laughs> uh, it was uh, Moses' favorite theorem, and certainly Cardo's. All right. So um, basically, let me let me now uh, try to argue uh, that I will try to explain what's the definition of uh, critical points if if the function uh, the eigenvalue as a function of parameters is, is not smooth, but it's still Lipschitz, so it's, it's fairly nice. So you're going to make a theory which is just uh, really just a, a, para a parametric family of matrices that you set up. You know where, okay, where it's coming from. Yes, I. Uh, the, this is this is the setup. Uh, the fact that it's matrices actually is not very restrictive. Yeah, you be compact. And, and you don't care that these are quasi momenta or you know. In the case I do not care where my parameters are coming from. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And this is a global theory or local. Theory? Uh, so it is going to be local that adds up to this is this is the global part. So the local part is how to set up. But this, most of it's local then. You're uh, going to show us how to deal with how to deal with the singularities locally. What goes in here in the polynomial and then the from local to global is is a, is yeah. a non step. You're going to define another type of Morse polynomial. Absolutely, yes, sir. So, uh, and, and again, it's, it has been defined. I'm just going to explain that it is actually possible to calculate it in this case. Uh, and the answer is, is actually universal uh, in the sense that if you have this eigenvalue multiplicity, it's, uh, you know, it's lots of surfaces touching at this point. Uh, when it's two, it's, it's a conical point, but when it's three or higher, it's in lots of dimensions, lots of surfaces touch. So it's a complicated picture, but uh, the idea is that the, 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 the gist of the result is that the picture is actually the same topologically. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your family of operators is. This intersection of new uh, surfaces, it's, it, it, it doesn't care. It looks topologically the same, and topologically exactly the same things come into this phenomenon. So um, this will have implications for the density of states and the Van Hoff singularities. Then uh, I I'm, I haven't progressed that far. I, I hope yes. But I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it sounds like you're saying there always are a hope singularity on <laughs> this, and you will explain what your assumption is, or you'll still be putting some assumption. Uh, in other words, with the periodic structures coming from something, and we could always have a flat band, for example. Yes, so, so this assumption is gonna be hidden in, in the family, which I'll uh, say it's generic. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, generic in, uh, 
it's what? not the case that I can just jiggle your the, if if you have these intersecting, can I just jiggle it a little bit and say then I mean you generically Morse and not need your theory? Was that just false? Uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Let's wait until you. Yeah, see. yeah. No, this is this is this, that is problematic. Uh, so we we tried tried it at first and didn't didn't make any progress. Um, so so let me define. Let me give some intuition. Uh, what's 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 a better definition? I define my critical points as the gradient equal to zero. That's not going to work because uh, we have points where the gradient is not defined. So how to define them? Uh, that's a fairly well-known thing. That uh, you just look at uh, level curves, or more precisely, sublevel sets. I'll, I'll define this in a sec, but uh, for level curves, we know what it is. So let's uh, think what happens at a minimum um, to level curves. So we can look at level curves at the level of critical points and epsilon above it, and at the level of critical points and epsilon below it. So below it, there are, it's a minimum, so there are no level curves. It's empty. But above the little circles, for for saddle points, they change from being hyperbolas one way to being hyperbolas the other way. And for maximum, they change from circles below to nothing above. So there is a topological change in the level curves as we cross the value at which our critical point sits. And that's the definition of critical point in the topological sense. So the definition is like this. Uh, define the, for a, for a function phi, that does not need to be differentiable anymore. Uh, Lipschitz is enough. Uh, the sublevel set is simply the set of all points where the function phi is smaller than the given value. And because really I want to work on local theory, I'll also define local sublevel set is the intersection of the global sublevel set with some, some neighborhood U of the point I'm interested in. There's a couple of definitions. And then X, It's called regular if the sublevel sets don't change once we pass through the value of the function. Uh, so th this is the, in the values, in the space of values. This is in the manifold. So um, a point is regular, fine. If there is some neighborhood, of the point X such that this local sublevel sets um, just below the value at this point is topologically equivalent to U just above. Uh, more precisely, is a strong deformation retract. Uh, if the point is not regular, then we call it, otherwise, we call it X, uh, we call it topologically critical. Where do you see all that it's liquid? Why don't you just why why isn't this defined for continuous? Um, it's a good question, and I'm I'm not sure 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, I, I do have that the eigenvalues are Lipschitz, uh, and I'm sure at some point uh, it's used, uh, uh, but maybe not inside this definition. And, and uh, another small point is that uh, this topologically critical is a stricter, uh, stricter definition than critical in the differential sense. For example, uh, a flat inflection point like x cubed. This point has zero gradient, so it's critical in terms of the gradient. But the topology of sublevel sets, sublevel sets are like this, so they they just stay the same. So it's not a topologically critical. So it, it, it excludes basically uh, degenerate. <laughs> All right. Um, so, and if we work with this topological notions, then uh, the Morse polynomial of phi locally around x, the, so, so that's the contribution. This monomial here in the more general setting is Poincare polynomial of the homology groups, relative homology groups of this sublevel set relative to that one. And basically, uh, the classical Morse theory uh, is proved by showing that these relative homologies are, in fact, homologies of sphere of uh, dimension nu, and therefore they have this, this polynomial, this one correct polynomial. All right, um, so let's, let's consider a little example. Uh, kind of running out of time, but I want to uh, show some pictures from here. So consider the following innocent, fairly innocent looking family of two by two matrices. C is just a parameter that is, uh, you can choose to be uh, values such as two or one half. And then for this values, I'll draw the surfaces. So, this is a matrix of three parameters. I cannot draw the eigenvalue as a function of three parameters. That's too hard. So I'm setting y equal to zero, and I'm drawing the eigenvalue surfaces for c equal to two and c equal to one half, or maybe vice versa. Yeah. Quote me on that. Uh, so here, the, there are two eigenvalues, of course, the two surfaces. Surfaces look like this. And there is another one, something like that. When C is equal to one half, we get a very similar picture. Oh, it looks very similar. Something like that. So two. Lambda one, lambda two, and here is lambda one, <coughs> lambda two. What's the difference between these two pictures? <clears throat> the difference, uh, like it's it's easy to understand and intuitively by doing what Peter said. Just let's let's just smooth and imagine we're smoothing this this uh, this curve, and this resolves into nice little bumps. So there are two points that are maxima. If you smoothen this point, we just don't get any critical points at all. 
uh, but uh, this comes from the same family with this same looking uh, structure. One, the first stop of the theory is to uh, try to predict on the level of just matrices when we will get this situation versus when we'll get that situation. And, uh, and this function is non-differentiable, but my, I am assuming my family is nice and smooth. So I would like to compute this polynomials on the level of derivatives of F. That's my desire. Uh, and Uh, I can state the first uh, of the results. Uh, this is the first derivative test. Uh, necessary condition. But for that, I need a little bit more terminology. So I'm just collecting my notation here. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm assuming now X is a point on M where I am experiencing a problem. So if, if the eigenvalue is simple, it's just a smooth function. I don't need to invent, uh, reinvent the bicycle. So uh, for a point, uh, so lambda K of F of X, I'm assuming it has some multiplicity. I denote it by new. And at that point, I uh, introduce u, which is different from my neighborhood u. I'm sorry about this. This is n by new matrix. I'm choosing a basis so I, of the eigenspace. So I'm choosing a basis. I'm putting it as columns in the matrix, matrix of eigenvectors. And I'll define. The operator H, uh, which acts on the tangent space at M, uh, at X to M, it gives me symmetric matrices that are new by new. So basically, what I'm doing, I am taking my F and I'm restricting it to this eigenspace. More precisely, I'm differentiating it. in the direction on the tangent manifold. And then I'm restricting the result to the eigenspace, <coughs> projecting it to the eigenspace. So this is derivative of F in the direction B, calculated at X, surrounded by, by my eigenvectors, uh, a whole bunch of them. So this is going to be my sort of derivative of the operator family. That's my indicator in the, in the first derivative, first derivative test. So if a range of H contains a positive definite matrix, this, this thing acts into matrices. It's like the general perturbation theory where you manage to separate out. Precisely. It's just the, the degenerate uh, perturbation theory around the degenerate eigenvalue. If in some direction this perturbation theory gives me a positive definite matrix and all eigenvalues are growing in that direction, then I do not have a critical point. Then X is regular. Uh, the way it's proved, uh, we kind of still need to, to relate it to, uh, to some topology, is by Clark different, subdifferential. And then there is a link between Clark differential, differential and algebraic topology. Theorem two is a first derivative test, but sufficient condition. So this should be viewed as necessary condition for a critical point is that the range does not contain a positive definite matrix. So uh, here, if, if the range of H 
orthogonal complement is a span of a positive matrix. So, so the orthogonal complement contains a positive definite matrix and it is one dimensional. So there are two conditions in one actually. Yeah. And two is, I'll explain it by picture. X is non-degenerate in the smooth direction. <laughs> then X is topologically critical. So what is this smooth direction? It is implicitly contained in, in this example. I just said, hey, I'm, I'm setting y to zero and I'm doing uh, the picture just with y being equal to zero. If we plot the picture in three dimensions, in all three parameters, x, y, z, very quickly, you find that the degeneracy here, the, the double degeneracy, this, this, this point, it happens on a curve in the three-dimensional space. And these two special points are here, and they are actually critical points, but there is a whole bunch of other points that are points of multiplicity, but they're not critical. So around each point of multiplicity, we can find the submanifold, this is x, this submanifold sx, along which the multiplicity stays constant. And along this submanifold, we can actually differentiate the, the eigenvalue again is smooth. So we can just differentiate in that direction. And the condition here says that I want to apply my just calculus in that direction. And I want the Hessian to be non non degenerate for another action. So, so, so this is the information in the direction transversal to this curve. So, so if I am resolving multiplicity, I want to resolve it. Uh, so, so, so this is, this is just uh, describing what happens there. And this is when I'm keeping my multiplicity constant. <clears throat> Could you just please repeat the first condition instead of B? So uh, I define this, this operator, which basically encapsulates the perturbation theory in all directions that I can go. And I want the range to have co-dimension one. So the orthogonal complement to have dimension one. And I want our orthogonal complement to be spanned by a positive definite matrix. So, so think about it this way. Positive definite matrices, uh, they belong either to the range or it's orthogonal complement. If it belongs to the range, then it's regular. If it belongs to orthogonal complement, then it's critical. There is a little gap in between when, when the matrices are not strictly positive definite. And so there is a gap between these two situations, uh, which allows sort of degenerate critical points to arise. <clears throat> so this, these two conditions, I, uh, we're calling non-degenerate, non-degenerate uh, topologically critical point. So there is, there is a space for degeneracy there as well. Yes. Yeah, so can you explain why the, the span of the orthogonal complement of the ratio would be one dimensional? Is there some variant of theorem two that applies when the span is higher dimensional or is it really? No, it's, it's a, this is a condition and you should understand it as transversality condition. So um, what is happening topologically is uh, we're mapping from the manifold to the space of all matrices. Within the space of all matrices, there is a fairly complicated set, which is matrices with degenerate eigenvalues. I want this mapping F to the space to cut this, uh, uh, this set of degenerate um, matrices with multiplicities. I want to cut it transversely. And this transversality is given 
by this uh, by the fact that the the dimension is is equal. Do you ever make use of the fact that that's co-dimension two? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes and no. I think it 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 comes up in a sec. Uh, let me. Yeah. So. <clears throat> it's it's, this it's a, in this picture actually. Is this hypothesis in some sense generic or? That, and so th so this um, the fact that uh, the range is either uh, is either dense in in symmetric or has at most the fact that the range has at most co-dimension one is a generic hypothesis. So so this is the transversality condition and it is generic. And I think the whole, this thing is generic with respect to perturbation of, of the matrices, of, of the family of matrices. So um, this point is important. So, so S, this, this manifold of uh, multiplicity, It's a set of points y in ux such that the eigenvalue y is uh, has multiplicity. New the co-dimension of this. Uh, we will denote it by S of new is in the real case is two if new is equal to if it's doubly degenerate the codimension is two if it's triply degenerate codimension is five etc. There is a nice formula for it and there is a nice formula for it in the complex case it's three and higher and, and something like that. so so this is an Nice quantity that I need. I'm not writing down the formula. It's uh, not uh, particularly useful. And I think I'm ready to state my theorem three and just finish the talk. So informally, theorem three says that uh, this eigenvalue multiplicities universe. So there are only two possibilities that can happen, and these possibilities are shown here. So for nu is equal to two, uh, the, the picture is always a cone, generically. It's always cones, but the cones can be upright, and then they give rise to critical points, or they can be sideways, and then they don't give rise to critical points, and that's all there is. But of course, in higher dimensions, there is more stuff intersecting, but it always intersects in the same way, and it can either be upright or sideways. And uh, me, I wrote the last last theorem here. Let me go over it. Basically, what we do is we we use. Uh, Stratified Morse theory. So we, we treat this space of degeneracies as a, as a stratification on our manifold M. And then uh, using stratified Morse theory of Gresky McPherson, we can separate the contributions, the Morse contributions, into the stuff that happens along the, this nice submanifold where everything is smooth and in the transversal direction. So along the smooth part, you just differentiate. You differentiate, you calculate the Hessian, you can get some, some uh, more synthesis that uh, depend on the family. But in the transversal direction, the situation is always the same. And here are the answers. And the answers are given in terms of homology groups. Um, and basically, the, the structure at the multiplicity is obtained by thinking about this point multiplicity point as, as a Grassmannian, as a set of planes of certain dimensions, and then calculating its, uh, uh, its homologies. R is the homology that we want to, the, the uh, 
the rank of the homology we want to calculate. This is the Morse index in the smooth direction, just to ship. And this S is the codimension that, that enters this guy. There are two cases in the real uh, case. Uh, this is a little bit more exotic homology, homology in twisted, twisted integers. I don't have time to go over it. Uh, in the complex case, as is usual in this uh, science, uh, the answers are a lot nicer. And here are some, some numbers. So, so this is the answers calculated, and these are the polynomials that take part, that will take part of this guy. So it will be this guy, but in the Smith direction times the stuff from the table. It's kind of, so this is the cone. The top sheet of the cone is, uh, so I didn't define I, but this refers to the top sheet in the intersection. This is the second sheet from the top. So the top sheet is always a minimum. The bottom sheet is always a maximum. If you have three sheets, the top is always minimum. The second sheet doesn't contribute anything to the Morse counting. And the, the bottom sheet is something, so something like this. And this is a wavy, something wavy here that contributes zero. And so on. Sometimes the, the contributions is a bunch of things. It's like a bunch of critical points merged together, stuck in this thing. And uh, a good question is whether this zero is like really zero. Is it a critical point? Yes, it is still a critical point. Uh, what happens is that these guys, uh, they have this structure of uh, these groups, they have a they have a free part and they have a torsion part. So the 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 generating functions here they only take into account the free part, ignoring the torsion part. But there is also torsion part, which basically uh, is a, is a ghost of of critical points. So so there is something here. It just um, you may think about it as, as there is some sort of perturbation of the matrix family that uh, that splits apart this uh, this this multiplicity, and it splits it into two critical points that upon merger just annihilate each other. So it looks like zero, but it's not fully zero, and there is some 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 non-trivial you know, twistiness in there, something like that. So so there is. Uh, if, if you compute the generating function of the torsion part, there is something non-trivial here, which in this case is a squared, and there is some other parts. So, so this is not really zero, and therefore the point is still critical as predicted by the theorem. All right, I'm sorry, I went over time. Thank you for your attention. When you say the eigenvalue multiplicity is universal, you mean the polynomial is universal. I mean the polynomial is universal. The polynomial, uh, uh, the polynomial describes the local topology. So the topology is somehow universal, hard to, hard to visualize because the dimensions are high. Uh, but for two that for, for multiplicity two, basically you can only have cone. You can you it's hard to imagine something else, but that's a proof that there is in, in one that. dimension. If I assume my family is analytic, can you can you prove relic in a new way? Uh, so in <laughs> one <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in one dimension, uh, you still have to assume some generous. We assume so this is assuming some some non-degeneracy. A non-degeneracy just just means that things that are prohibited by code dimension don't happen. And then you just don't, we, we, we don't have the uh, yeah, yeah. intersections. I mean, the remarkable thing is he says there's always a basis. It's kind of, it's a, it's a non-trivial theorem. I mean, you can give an algebraic proof, but. Uh, the, the, yeah, the fact but, that if you have a definition, right? But what do you mean is the, is the I, I, I can. Yeah, I'm the winner. <laughs>
I can vector along this curve is, is nice and smooth if we try to move the eigenvector, like track, track the eigenvector. At this point, out that if we want to look to, what can we study without any assumptions? Uh, in other words, there may be some things that still survive all this. You make some the topology and then you make some, you compute something from that and maybe some lower bound for the number of nodal domains, which is universally true. Um, so at that point, you would be wanting a theorem which actually says for all, right? I, and and uh, that's where relic is kind of interesting is you just have a one parameter and uh, there is a relic basis. <laughs> I, I, it's constructed quite clever. I, I, I know, but that's the relic basis would mean that the, you have a special choice of you there yeah. when you put the, the metric. Right, it's what you need. And for that special thing, the HX would have uh, would have analytic functions on its diagonal. Right. Now the, the so, issue is these eigenvalues cross each other. It's you're resolving. You're saying, I mean, what what, what is the, the to give the eigenvalues of a matrix? It's a algebraic condition. So all these functions are algebraic in your case. Yes. Because you find out dimension. He, he can do it even in the algebraic case is no easier than that really yeah. yeah but but if you have more than one parameter then you yeah, yeah, yeah. will understand. have these guys so you cannot resolve it ah, this fine structure i agree completely but there may be a consequence of the structure which remains that, that to, remains to to get an degenerate from this i have specifically your theorem that um if you would take a graph and you want to count the number of uh, nodal domains, you get a lower bound, but you have to assume generic, and maybe some of these things are true without assuming generic. I'm sure they're true. <laughs> you, the ge generic is an assumption here, but the hope is that you can prove that if you have a graph and then you you allow yourself some perturbations of the graph, then the perturbations will give you generic values. So, so, so it's an, an extra step required. And uh, at this point, we cannot be, no, no. do without this step. We're hoping to go beyond generic case and to study more degenerate cases and to classify those as well. The answer will not be so neat and no. universal, but we're still hoping to get something. And as I say, maybe there will be a bounce. About By the way, what's a Dirac? Is that one of these? Uh, this is a direct yeah. So, so I guess I understand why the normal Morse data in the complex case should be independent of uh, of the choice of f, but uh, but in the real case, I don't I don't see that at all. Uh, I mean, typically normal, normal Morse data, you, you turn the f upside down, and the normal Morse data gets continued screwed up. Hey. So we'll have to discuss. You'll have to explain to me why do you think complex is is obvious? Because that's all. But to me, it came out of the proof. So I, I, I don't have the intuition for either of this case why why it's universal. Oh, but seems amazing. <laughs> seems yeah. amazing to me. Great. Yeah, but it's beautiful. <laughs> is it like that you? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm talking about the same thing, but you, but but you cannot cancel all of the homology of the torus by these cancellation elements. Um, you're talking about this extra bit? So no, no, like, uh, what's the question about uh, the fact that you, that- Van Hope singularity, so are they always there? Yeah, so th th that you cannot read of- Oh, read of right, right, right. Yeah, so, um, so how does it apply to Van Hove singularities, more or less, is, uh, let me interpret your question as how does, would this apply to Van Hove singularities, is basically there are no t's. There are no t's in this thing, so, uh, so the t part in the Poincaré polynomial, uh, Poincaré polynomial is t squared t plus t plus one, or, or some higher, high level, this part cannot be canceled by any of these guys. So T's, two T's, sorry, two T's, two T's will survive and they must therefore be canceled by the smooth saddle points that lead to Van Hove singularities. 
Does it make sense? So, yeah, so but like, um, just to clarify, you can not just add these guys, but these guys multiplied by some power of t, because you can change the index in the smooth oh, yeah, yeah, in the smooth direction. But yeah. it's still not divisible by them, so it's so something remains. Yeah, something, something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I kind of improvised, but you're right. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know this uh, Dureski McPherson theorem, but where does it appear here? I mean, is that. Uh... So, so, this allows us to just pull out the, the contribution and the smooth part and just say, okay, just, it's just additional factor and, uh, and focus on the, on the non uh, in the direction in which the eigenvalue is split. Right. So, so it's. Kind of at a critical point, we there are three directions. One direction is smooth. We yeah. take care of it yes. by calculus and 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 uh, and in transversal condition, uh, transversal direction, we do our calculation. And the fact that these things just add up and, uh, and 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 just can be fed straight into there, it, this is the first. So this. Is, Universal service you're talking about is presumably the um, discriminant of the characteristic polynomial. Um, I mean, the discriminant measures uh, yeah, the, the, simultaneous. Yes, uh, yes, is defined by the discriminant part. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so it's yeah. I mean, what's interesting here is you're building in the self-adjointness into. Normally, I mean, people have studied the degeneracies of eigenvalues or families, but the self adjointness uh, is something that does this co dimension to it, opens up this whole door. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, is, this is absolutely crucial. So, so we, yes, the, the fact that our families are self adjoint uh, yeah, is central to the whole thing, yeah. and I think it's central to the cleanness of the results. Oh, so that's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or, or questions? Thank you again.